As we enter the nanomaterial section of this course, we need to begin by discussing the crystalline solid state. When we think about the way that solids form, we can think about them as like individual atoms, represented as spheres. And if we were to think about an amorphous solid, something like glass, so when glass forms, the silicon dioxide from sand is heated up and basically until it melts. And when it melts, it is allowed to cool very slowly over time and stretched. And as it does so, it congeals together and forms what we know as glass. So the way that these amorphous solids form, again, that's amorphous, meaning that it doesn't have a solid, repeatable, ordered kind of uh, orientation. It does so in a way that is effectively completely random. So each of the molecules or atoms in an amorphous solid basically just orient in totally random fashion. And if you notice, there's no repeating pattern in this amorphous solidification. And when we think about the way that that is represented on an energy diagram, if we were to think about the distance between each of these atoms or solids or whatever they are, then we can think about this in terms of an energy dip at the lowest energy state. And for an amorphous solid, because it's not an ordered, packed situation, it's unlikely to be in the most energetically favorable state. So we might say that the energy level of this amorphous solid is represented here on the graph. Whereas if we were to instead consider something that is densely packed and more tightly and more ordered, this might look something like this, where you have everything in a repeatable pattern forming what are known as crystals. And you have probably encountered crystals before, either in laboratory or you've seen them out in the wild, where they, they look uh, crystalline. That's, that's why we call them crystals. And on an energy diagram, these are actually going to be much lower in energy. So this actually manifests as the lowest energy state and when that happens we get these crystalline solids that are formed. Now we're going to take a look at the 14 Brabe lattices that make up all of the different orientations that crystals can actually form. Let's start with the simplest example, aptly named the simple cubic unit cell. Here is a structure, and I can manipulate it, which is why I'm using this modality to showcase the simple cubic uh, unit cell in the crystal class. And what you should notice is that each of the sides of this cube are the same length, all of the angles at the corners are the exact same, and there is a single sphere indicating an atom at each corner. If we zoom in to the center of this unit cell, now we're inside looking at this, what you should see is that only part of that sphere, because it's at the corner, is actually located inside of the unit cell. And that is true for all of them. In fact, about one eighth of each of these spheres is contained inside of the unit cell. And we need to account for that when thinking about the way that these structures orient. Now, if we were to add on additional unit cells into a larger array of these simple cubic structures, this is what things actually look like when solids form in the simple cubic uh, crystal class they end up forming these in effectively infinite arrays of these unit cells and which is why it's easier to think about them in terms of a single unit cell because they're just repeating patterns of the same thing now if we were to zoom out just a little bit we can actually start to look at things like the coordination number for a single atom so what I'm going to do is actually take a screenshot of this so that I can start to draw on the shape. So if we were to look specifically at this atom that I'm going to highlight for you, this atom in particular, and we were to look at all of the other atoms that are coordinated to this atom, we can find what's called its coordination number or the number of other atoms that it is coordinated to. And these are already drawn in with lines to showcase that there is an atom that is coordinated to that center atom. Here is another atom that is coordinated to it. One going in this direction, one going straight up, and one going straight down. And if we were to count these, we would count one, two, three, four, 
5, and then this one makes the sixth atom that it is also coordinated to. So for that reason, we would say that the coordination number indicated by Cn is equal to 6 for the simple cubic crystal class. Here is a body-centered cubic structure, and as you can see, it looks very similar to the simple cubic uh, crystal structure, unit cell. However, inside of this unit cell, there is a whole atom located directly in the center of the cube. We still have the eight corner atoms contributing one eighth of an atom into the unit cell, but we also have a whole one on the direct inside. Here we have the crystal structure of a unit cell for face-centered cubic. And what you should notice about this structure is that there are no atoms contained completely inside of the unit cell. However, what we notice that differs from the simple cubic unit structure is that on all of the faces of the cube, half of an atom or sphere is located inside. This is called face-centered cubic. And since there are half of an atom contained inside, each of the faces are covered, and there are one, two, three, four, five, six faces, each contributing half of an atom. That gets us a total of three, plus the one that adds up from the one-eighth of the eight corner atoms for a total of four atoms contained in this unit cell. Now that you've seen a few different examples of these crystal classes and structures, let's take a look at how you might actually see them written out in two dimensions. So in the models that I just showed, I was able to rotate them to show you the three dimensionality of those cubic structures or those crystal structures. But when presented on a piece of paper, I can only provide them to you in two dimensions. So we need to be able to take a look at the structures that we've been provided that we've tried to implement some three-dimensional structure to and see if we can do things like calculate how many things are present inside of each of these unit cells. So remember, these are just depictions of a single unit cell. And the reality is that when crystals form, that unit cell is the simplest form of that crystal structure. The reality of their existence, though, is that they are an, it's effectively an infinite array of these unit cells stacked on top of, next to, and under one another. So each of these would be extended several more cubes. And I've provided two examples that we can walk through so that you know how to do these in the future. On the screen are going to, is going to be the simple cubic structure and the body-centered cubic structure. Remember, we talked about how there's an eighth of an atom or an eighth of a thing at each corner of a cube inside of the unit cell. So actually inside of this unit cell, there is an eighth of an atom in this instance. And that is true at every one of these corners. Only an eighth of these spheres, meant to represent atoms, are actually present inside. So when we do the calculation to figure out contained in a single unit cell, how many atoms do we have? We need to remember that there's one eighth for every corner. And if we counted the number of corners on a cube, we would get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So there are eight corners in a cube, which means that there is a total of one atom contained in this unit cell. Now let's take a look at body-centered cubic. So similar to the simp uh, simple cubic structure, there are, for every corner, regardless of the structure, there is one eighth of an atom or element contained inside of that unit cell. And again, just like in the simple cubic structure, there are eight corner atoms. So those eight corner atoms multiplied by one eighth for each contained in the unit cell give us that same one. However, we need to consider the fact that in the center of that cube, there is an entire sphere or an entire atom. That is the definition of body-centered cubic. And since there is a full atom inside, then we need to add these two together to figure out that there are two total atoms contained inside of the body-centered cubic unit cell.
When trying to discern how many types of atoms are contained inside of a unit cell, we need to be able to visualize it in three dimensions. So provided for you on, the, on this side of the screen is the way that oftentimes they are provided to you on exams, on sheets of paper, on pieces of paper, etc. And this is the way that you will most often see them. Sometimes, however, you are provided with what's called a cross section. So if we consider the bottom left hand side to be the origin of a graph or where the y axis is zero and the x axis is zero, then we would say that that is z is equal to zero. And if we were to move up one unit cell, so from the bottom of the unit cell to the top of the unit cell, we would say that this location is equal to z equals one. And similarly, at this point, we would say that z is equal to one half. And just like taking a layer of a cake, for example, if we were to cut one single layer at z equals zero, we would find that that layer would look like this. Similarly, if we were to take just the single layer contained at z equals one half, we would see that it cuts directly through the middle of the unit cell to look like this, where the cesium ion is contained. And similarly, at z equals one, we see that at that cross section, it, it looks the exact same as at z equals zero. And sometimes on exams or different questions that you're provided, you will be uh, provided with these cross sections to help you visualize a two dimensional structure in three dimensions. So I can see almost immediately that this is some sort of pseudo body centered cubic structure where we have one eighth of an atom contained at every corner of the cube and then also in the direct center of the cube completely encompassing an a, a single atom. So this is also um, depicted here in these cross sections. And hopefully you can see that this is the bottom layer, the middle layer, and the top layer of this cube. Again, if you were to take out and actually cut out different cross sections. And this can be helpful in, in the event that you're not able to easily visualize in three dimensions a unit cell. So we were tasked to find how many of each of the different ions that make up cesium chloride are present in this unit cell. So cesium is going to be the easiest one. There's only a single cesium even sphere present in this unit cell, and it's in the direct center. Importantly, this is completely encased in the unit cell, where the ion is actually being attracted to the chloride anions from all of these different positions. In fact, I would say that there are eight different ions coordinated to that center cesium ion. So therefore, if I had asked what is the coordination number for cesium, the answer would be that its coordination number is eight because it is being surrounded by or coordinated to eight different chloride ions. And I know that since that single sphere located at the center of the unit cell is completely encased by the unit cell, that there is one cesium ion present in this unit cell. Now we can do the calculation for chloride if we recall that at every corner, for a corner, there is one eighth of a thing. So one eighth of the chloride ion is contained inside of the unit cell. The other eighths, the remaining seven eighths, are present in other unit cells if we were to extend this in an infinite array. So therefore, I need to count up the number of corner chloride ions, and if I did, I would find that there are eight, and I would find that there are a total of one chloride ions present in this unit cell. Even though the contribution is coming from eight different ions, contained exclusively inside of that unit cell, there's only a total, if we were to add them up, one chloride ion. And notice that this matches the formula for cesium chloride. If you were to write the ionic uh, chemical formula for cesium chloride, you would have written CSCl because you know that CS has a one plus charge, which is neutralized and balanced out by the one minus charge for a chloride ion. 
and this can be helpful to remember that it's a way that you can check your work. You should end up with the same number of elements, one and one in this case, as would make up a normal neutral compound. So when we get to other examples like magnesium oxide, magnesium has a two plus charge, oxygen has a two minus charge, that should be a one to one ratio of ions present in that uh, unit cell. But for something like calcium fluoride, where you have a calcium with a two plus charge and fluoride always has a one minus charge, you should have ions that add up to Ca1F2, which should match the ionic chemical formula that you would have predicted based on what you learned in general chemistry. So altogether, we need to start thinking about the way that solids form. We are moving into a section where we need to think about what this means as far as the electrons in a system. Because it turns out that most of the solid state chemistry that makes up the universe today, like the batteries in your phone, the screens on your computer that you're watching this on currently, are made up of crystalline solid state materials.